Welcome to the Men's Journal Everyday Warrior Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Sorelli. I'm joined with Mark Graney, probably one of the... Would, have you ever been accused of having an overactive imagination? <laughs> yes, I've been accused of that a long time before I was making money off of it. <laughs> I, so as a kid, like, were your parents like... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a thing they call maladaptive daydreaming, where you don't really pay attention to anything other than these little stories in your head. And um, I didn't know what it was called. They, they didn't have names for the stuff we were going through when we were at my age, but uh, now I know what it was. And uh, it, it's fascinating. It was just like, you know, I just had year-long uh, plots going on in my head of what was going on in my life that was not true. I, so I'm so interested in the process, and for those listening, Mark is a 15-time New York Times bestseller. The number one, I'll say it, number one uh, international thriller uh, author. Worked with Tom Clancy in his latter years as part of the uh, the Jack Ryan series. And then he is the creator of the Gray Man series, which you know had the film with Ryan Gosling. Yeah. And I'm drawing a blank on uh, Captain America. Chris Evans. Chris Evans. <laughs> Which uh, was a great film, and I, I'd love to get your opinions on that because sure. I know, yeah, you know, probably if it hit your expectations. But um, how, did you do well in school, or were no? I really didn't, and in fact, I was I was bad in English, and so I've, I've, I spoke I speak at school sometimes, and I I say I was bad at English, and I immediately go, but that hurts me every day. Like if if I had paid attention to grammar in seventh grade. I'm like, I'm never going to need any of this stuff. I need that stuff every single day. And every day it hurts me. Um, so I, I was not good in school. I just uh, was kind of lazy. Uh, I love soccer and being lazy. And <laughs> and um, in, in college, I started studying international relations and political science and just fell in love with it. But it was three years into my college career when I was getting like, I was working three jobs and I was making like C's. And then suddenly I was interested in something and uh, kind of locked into that. And and uh, so I did really well my last couple of years of college. That's when I first became a good student. What, what, what was it about international policy and, and politics that just brought you in? I think, so my father was the head of the NBC affiliate in Memphis, Tennessee, where, where I lived and, and still live to this day. And so I grew up around the news. He was also a combat vet from the Second World War. Um, he was in Germany when the war ended and was just got to the Philippines when the war ended in... in no kidding. Yeah, yeah, so so he, he was redeployed to yeah. then join the, uh, yeah, yeah. the war in the Pacific. And when they, they declassified the, the plan for the invasion of Japan, I think in the 90s or something, they declassified part of it. And he saw that his, his, his was going to be like the first army division in Tokyo Bay. I mean... Way after the Marines, I'm sure. But still, um, I'm like, yeah. The, ask me about the atomic bombs, and I'm like, yeah, pretty good idea because uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't exist otherwise. You know, saved millions of lives. You, you know, you say after the Marine Corps, but and I'm, I'm sure you probably know this. The Army did more amphibious invasions yeah, than the Marine Corps. That's during, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ask MacArthur. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know, the Marine Corps loves to tout that we're the amphibious infantry, but yeah, yeah. you know, Army's always like, ah, oh, World yeah, yeah, War, yeah, World War Two, <laughs> buddy. Um, so. You know, in terms of childhood, you know, normal childhood, Memphis. And let me ask you about Memphis. Yeah. Because we used to train in Shaw's, Mississippi, in yeah. the SEALs. So, you know, yeah, okay. yeah, sure. uh, Mid-South Shooting Institute. Mm -hmm. Lake Cormorant. Yes. Right. Yeah. right down from the uh, casinos. Yeah. And we loved, it was it Beale Street? Mm -hmm. Is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. But I, I've heard Memphis has really, like, gotten bad. I heard it was, what do they call it? Like the, uh, the meth triangle or... Yeah, it's uh, crime is is really really bad and and getting worse and um, you know I don't even know how this sounds but crime is encroaching on areas where it hasn't before so I don't even know if the crime is worse um, like I uh, you know I I know people that have been killed <laughs> um, a, a guy that I've known for twenty something years was shot dead about three weeks ago and that's very uncommon and it doesn't happen yeah. every three weeks yes. but uh really wonderful guy i knew his brother better but um, just just random he was yeah he worked uh at a bar and was in midtown and was just walking back to his car and um his wallet was gone and he, and he had been shot and that's all they know <sighs> and um a very sad story a, a, a young woman who taught at the um, preschool like literally i could throw a baseball to mm -hmm. it from where i live um, was jogging at 4.30 in the morning training for a marathon. This was back in the fall. And um, a guy got out of a van, took her. Um, they found her dead. 
That, that was, I remember that yeah. one in the news. Eliza Fletcher, yeah, yeah, horrible. And so these things are happening. There was an attempted abduction, basically, where my wife walks every day. And she does not carry, she, um, uh, she's carrying mace. And I'm like, well, we got to get you trained because it's just, yeah. it's getting crazier and crazier. And sadly, the situation with the police in Memphis, unfortunately, there was this really bad incident in January where they, where they beat a guy to death or certain police officers. Yes. I know some great cops yes. in Memphis. I know great cops in Memphis, but, um, yeah, it's, it's really tough. It's getting tougher, and um, I don't see an end to it, unfortunately. You know, I hate when, uh, when you brush in these broad strokes, mm-hmm. and 98% of the, the Memphis Police Department is doing great, yeah. great work, and Absolutely. then the 2% does something stupid, and yeah. all of a sudden the Memphis exactly. Police are bad. Yeah, and that was, you know, it's that people are like, defund the police because yeah. of this horrible thing, and it's like, Idiots. that's a horrible thing, and that hurts yeah. the... the the good cops. Memphis is a wonderful town. I love living there. I could live anywhere I want, and this is where I choose to live. Um, but I just, honestly, in the last year, the crime has gotten worse and worse. You know, the same thing with the, the military is one seal will end up on, on the front page. And sure. Then, and then, you know, certain people take advantage of that, and they're like, the seals are out of control. They need to be disbanded. It's like, yeah. you know, hey, simmer down now. Yeah, right, yeah. Let me tell you, for every 10,000 good things, there's like like one or maybe a dozen bad things we right. do. But we own our mistakes and we're a human organization. Right. Growing up in Memphis was a very different. It it felt different, or, mm-hmm. or else I was oblivious to it. You know, I, I um, you know, like I said, my dad was in news, so we talked about the news all the time, and and you know there was crime, and that was one of the things we discussed. But it was I was more interested kind of in inter- international things, and so was my dad. Um, I was not, like I said, it it seems like it's encroaching on areas, which is you know I'm speaking in broad strokes, but um, there's parts of town, you know, I always say, like, nothing bad to me has really ever happened to me in Memphis, but I can get in my car and make something bad happen in yeah. about five minutes, you yeah. know, if, if you go to the wrong place. I was just down in Mexico, and people are like, you're going to Mexico? And I'm going, like, yeah, statistically way, <laughs> way yeah. safer where I'm going to be in Mexico. Yeah. Uh, were you on vacation? Yeah, or? I just had the kids down in Tulum, about an hour and a half south of Cancun. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. It, it, you know those cities, Cabo, Tulum, um, Cancun, I mean, they're all taking action to make. I mean, their 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 livelihood depends on the tourism, yeah. so they're oh yeah, Dude, they're, they're taking action to make I sure. I saw Americans Mexican feel Marines, safe. Mexican Army, yeah. their National Guard, their municipalities, their judiciales. Um, I got shaken down by some cops for a couple hundred bucks. Um, that happens when yeah. you go to Mexico. Yeah. You got to bring a little extra cash. We, 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 yeah, we always uh, brought a uh, slush fund for yeah. you to pay off, and uh, <laughs> uh, but that was at the uh, the, the expense of the uh, the taxpayers. Right. right. Um, so. You know, your story is interesting that you're, you were almost like a, I, I hate to use this word, a struggling actor working because mm-hmm. you were working yeah. in bars and yeah. restaurants yeah. Yeah. Uh, while you were starting to write your books. So, you, know, you started working in bars and restaurants in college? Yes. Uh, yeah. And then I kind of kept working in restaurants, even mm-hmm. though I had like jobs and sales and stuff like that. Um, and I just was picking it being a writer, like I started reading, I picked up a Tom Clancy book, never read any fiction whatsoever. And I picked up a Tom Clancy book in 87. Patriot Games? Patriot Games, yeah. I was 19 years old and um, changed my life. And, and honestly, that's when I, I changed my major. I mean, I was basically just a business major. And then it wasn't just Tom Clancy, but I started reading Frederick Forsyth and Nelson DeMille and Graham Greene and all these guys. And, and, uh, one day I was going to meet my uh, counselor at school, which I had to do like once a year. And it's like, yeah. yeah, business, I guess, you know, to me, like college was like 13th grade and 14th grade. I wasn't really thinking about, you know, I just thought I was destined to work in a cubicle somewhere. And, uh, and I just saw this thing about international relations. I was like, well, that looks interesting. Boom. You know, changed everything. I was a business major. Yeah. Undergrad. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've come and I've told my, well, my son wants to go computer science. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, if, if that's what you, you want to do, he's already built his own computers, yeah. then go that direction. Yeah. But for anyone who tells me they want to take business, I'm like, hey, let me give you three suggestions. History, uh, psychology, or English. Yeah. Like, learn to, because all of those are going to force you to, to well, yeah. either learn about humans or to, to write. Yeah. Then if you want to go into business, yeah. I'll, I'll send you to go get your MBA yeah, afterwards. Yeah, I, I think that the toughest thing is is the lack of understanding of history because there's so many things that have happened in this, you know, happened politically or whatever. It's like, God, read that book on John Adams. This stuff was all happening 250 years ago, and we haven't really learned anything, you know. Patterns. Yeah, patterns. For sure. So y- you fall in love 
with Tom Clancy and these thrillers. Yeah. But it, what, what was the precipice that pushed you over the edge? You said, fuck it, I'm going to write my own. <laughs> I, I was taking a class in international terrorism in the criminal justice department. Um, this is right after I declared my major. Mm-hmm. And I kind of, I was just sitting in class doing my daydreaming stuff. And I kind of got this idea. We were, it was something about Lebanon and um, all the different groups there at the time. There were about yeah. 17 yes. different factions fighting against one another at the same time. And, uh, and I got this kind of idea for a story, and I, and I remember thinking, like, oh, I wish somebody, I'd love to read a book about that. I wish somebody would write that, you know. And after a while, I was 22, and I started writing it. Um, I just said, I'm just going to start writing this. But I uh, didn't have a lot of belief in myself. I, didn't, I thought that only happened to, like, special people, yeah. you know. It's like you got to know somebody or whatever. So it took me 15 years to finish my first book. But I stuck with it, and I put it aside, and I went back and put it aside. And I finished it in 15 years, and... Like, the funny thing is, like, the internet was invented while I was writing this book. So <laughs> then I, when I finished it, I was able to look like, hey, how do you write a book? And I was like, okay, I've got too many characters. It's too long for a first-time author. You know, all these, like, nuts and bolts things that I had done wrong. But I was like, when, you, when I think about it, I can say it took me 15 years to write this, but how hard was I working for 15 years? I, now that I've done it, I can do it. And I wrote my second book in seven months. And that book, so the first book never showed it to any agents or editors or anybody. I think my mom read it. Um, it what, what was the title of it? It was called uh, Brotherhood of Vengeance. Yeah, it was about like sort of a, uh, a young American kind of hayseed country boy who has his girlfriend who's an exchange student, and she's killed in a terrorist incident. And then he is sucked into this like vengeance mission, but it's all kind of a setup by the Mossad. And it was kind of... I think it's a good story, but I, it'll never be published because people are like, why can't you get that published now? And I'm like, I, it's like the car back behind your house that you've taken all the good parts out of and, and used for something else. I, given your reputation, I guarantee if you, you publish that, it, it, you, you sort of set the expectations like, hey, this is where it started. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. But you would see a lot of stuff there like, wait, I remember that in the fourth oh, grade man yeah. book. Yeah, it's just all, all these action scenes or whatever, set pieces. So was Court gen- uh, Gentry? Uh, yep. Created in that first novel? No, no, and not in the second one. Um, the second one was called uh, The Last Enclave, and it was mm-hmm. about the Bosnia. It was about um, the Srebrenica massacre, but it was like an alternative history type of thing. And I was really proud of it, but that I got in front of an agent, and he's like, wow, you write action so well, and you're a very good writer. This is way too ambitious for somebody that's never been published before. He's like, this is like uh, Herman Wolk or Michener or something like that. And he's like, I want something, you know, like more just mainstream guy with a gun on the cover action thing. So I wrote this book called Goon Squad, which is mm-hmm. my third book. Mm-hmm. And, and that's right. There's, okay. there's a year and a half in between each one of these things. So this was still a lengthy process. And, uh, and I gave him Goon Squad. And that had this character, the gray man, Court Gentry, in it. And one of the little subplots is that there are these vi- groups of villains after him for things he'd done in the past. And mm-hmm. it was just kind of almost mm-hmm. a cool subplot while he's trying to do this main mission and my agent called me up and you know i had been waiting to hear from him for a year and he calls me up he's like i'm not gonna tell you what you want to hear he's like i think there, there's agents that would represent this and might be able to get it published but i think you could do so much better if you just rewrote the entire book and just kept the main character didn't do it in first person because i did it in first person and um and then turn the subplot in, into the main thing and i remember going like thinking to myself, wait a second, you said there were some agents that might represent yeah. me. <laughs> Could you just give me the, their the name? Path of you, because uh, you're, you're like, okay, yeah. here's another year of my life. Yeah. Um, but he was absolutely right. So I went and I started writing Gray Man. And um, just followed by what he said, I sat out in the parking lot of the office where I worked and had a five-minute conversation with him the next six months of my life. That's all I did. I was uh, go to Starbucks at 5.30 every morning, 7.30 and on the weekends. And I finished in six months, went to Europe, did some location research. You're kidding me. Yeah. So I, I'm gonna assume you don't have much money, but you, you're yeah. you're you're dishing out to go to yeah to I, Europe to do uh, yeah. I I told myself that like all my discretionary income was gonna go to trying to be a published author because I I was actually talking to this agent and he was saying I'm not gonna represent this, but you're really good. You should keep it. You know. So that that was I was falling, but I was falling forward, and that was a nice thing. And so I was starting to believe that maybe one of these days I could hold a book in my hand with my name on it. You know. And and so. Yeah, I went to Europe just with a backpack and did buses and didn't even, couldn't even afford cabs, you know, and uh, spent like 
all my vacation time, borrowed a couple of personal days and uh, did like 11 days and just went on the route that the gray man goes on in, in the story, which is a little different than the movie, but a lot of the same places. And then you took peripheral of what you were seeing. Yeah. And put it, uh, yeah. that's. Yeah, yeah. It, it did uh, this publicist basically say, hey, I want you to set a foundation. The gray man was really, I mean, it's a story, but it's also character development for which. So my agent didn't really talk about it being a series. I mean, he just wanted to get me published. And the editor who, so it went out to 10 editors, uh, different publishing houses in New York, and nine of them turned it down. And the 10th one was Tom Clancy's editor. He was the one that decided to take a chance on me. Although it was just a paperback, there, there was no hardcover. I have people email me and they're like, hey, I've got your first uh, book hardcover, first edition, but I've got some coffee stain on it. Is there any way you could uh, send me one? you know, gratis or something. And, and I'm like, wow, I've never seen a hardback of my first book. You know, it doesn't exist. Um, so it was just a small release. But right before it came out, my editor said, hey, can you can you do two more in the, and make this a series? And I said, sure. Like, what about? And he's like, I don't know. I'm that's, not the writer. You, man. That's, yeah. I was like, oh, that's, that's, how, that's how series works. So I talked to people that are authors now, and they're always talking about their series. You know, they they're unpublished, but they, you know, they're like, it's going to be a series. And I'm like, don't worry about the series. Worry about the first book. Trust me. Yeah. If it's good, they will make you write a series. <laughs> All in on that. Yeah. And then yeah. Let, let's talk afterwards. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is when the movie came out, did they do a hardback version? No, they did a, a movie tie-in version, which is paperback. But there's still not, not been a hardcover gray man. Yeah. I, I, I'm trying to think of how many, well, I, you know, Tom Clancy's. I've, I've seen those hardback. Sure. Yeah, most of your books now are hardback as well, right? Yeah, that yeah. Version? Starting with book five in the series. So uh, my new one, Burner, is book 12. So um, book, starting with book five in the series, they've, they've all been hardcover. And is that merely a cost thing? Because I, I guess so. I remember asking my agent early on. I was like, should I be, like, freaking out that they're, they're not going to do it in hardback? He said it was really, really good advice. He's given me a lot of good advice. But he, he said no because he's seen authors – First-time authors were publishing houses have had to make a huge financial commitment to get them hardcover and a bigger advance and all this other stuff, and it doesn't really earn out. So he's like, I'd rather you just get the book out, get your name out there, build it up from there. And, and, and um, this is great, great advice. It's amazing how far we've come because I always remember seeing thrillers like in grocery stores, mm -hmm. where, which I'm assuming back in like the 90s, early yeah. 2000s yeah, was yeah. Where, where most of the people bought them. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm assuming Amazon is the number one seller for it's i mean it it's big yeah <laughs> yeah it's it, i don't think they really release their numbers but um you know they it, it is definitely big and then when you when you do see retail space for it, it's usually like five authors in james three of them are james patterson you know yeah so do you do audio versions mm -hmm. of your book is yeah, that, yeah. Do, you, do you narrate those no, or no they, they bring in the yeah they have, they have a great guy his name's jay snyder and he's done all the gray man books and everybody tells me how brilliant I am to pick him. I'm like, they only gave me two guys to choose from. And they were, they were honestly, they were both good, but I, I thought this guy might be the best. And so he's done, he's done all 12 of the gray man books and people are always like, you better keep Jay for the next book. I'm like, it's up to him. I can't make him do it, but I, I as far as I'm concerned, he can do them all. And he does a great job. I, I have no doubt. What, do you know the ratio of, let's say paper to audio? Now, in terms of sales, what, what the ratio is? I don't honestly, because uh, my audio is done by audible and yeah I, i'd say the um ebook to paper is probably about 35 percent heart you know or to 65 paper to 65 yeah. percent ebook and i don't know where the um i don't know where audio is it's probably 20 or 25 yeah or but it's, it seems like everyone's going to audio yeah because everyone's just listening in the car and yeah. that's how they can i love reading books and i love listening to audio so. there's nothing like the feel of a book yeah. though i and, totally agree and it's almost the pride of when you finish the book you put it on the shelf mm -hmm. yeah and I know for people that have your entire series, that's, yeah, that's insane. Yeah. Let me, so again, the process for how much you produce, actually, let's talk about Tom. Mm -hmm. So after the gray man comes out, you do two more, correct? Yeah, that's right. And it's after the third one. Yeah. The third release that they, they put in front of you. Hey, Tom, Tom's getting older. He needs help. Yeah. I turned in this, I turned in the third book. It hadn't come out yet. Mm -hmm. And I was waiting to hear my, editor tell me what he thought and it was taking weeks and little did I know that they were trying to find a co-author for Tom Clancy. He'd had another co-author, a guy named Grant Blackwood who had done a book mm -hmm. and that had been successful, but I think Grant was going to step away. So I got this call and they're, they're like, would you be interested? And they weren't offering me the job. They were just gauging my interest. And I, um, 
I remember thinking like, why do I have to start with Clancy? <laughs> why can't I start like a step above where I am now? You know, somebody that's had a hardback. I haven't even had that. And it's like, we're going straight to the top. But I was like, I can't obviously turn this down. Yeah. And I've got, and I, I did know the Clancy world because I'd read all those books. My dad and I would give each other Clancy books for, no for Christmas for yes. 20 years or so. And he, he had passed away before I got published. But um, I, they, they didn't just offer me the job. So time was going on like a few weeks and I sort of realized this book is going to be due whenever they give me the job. The book's going to, the due date's going to be exactly the same. So am I going to have six months to work on it or five months or four months or three months, you know, and obviously Tom. So I wrote, I, I just, on my own, I wrote like 50 page tryout just to show all, the, it was just a scene that wasn't even in a book. It was just this thing that had Chavez and, and um, John Clark and, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and Jack Ryan, of course, and the whole people interacting with each other. And it was an action scene. And uh, never used it in anything. And I gave them that. And then they had me go up to Baltimore to meet Tom. And uh, and then I had the gig. What, what was that like? What, what, well, what was your initial impression of my initial? So it was early in my career. I used to deal with a lot of social anxiety, like a lot of social anxiety. Yeah. So this was, you know, that was just like horrifying. Um, I remember when I first started talking to them about doing it, they're like, you might never meet Tom in person. I remember going like, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Not, not that I didn't want to meet him. It was just sort of like, okay, that's, the, I don't know if I can handle it. Yeah. I went to meet him in Baltimore. Um, he had the whole top floor of the Ritz Carlton towers in, in, in Baltimore. And I was told that I was going to meet his wife first and then she would take me into the office to meet him. So I brought her this big thing of flowers and uh, a housekeeper or an assistant opened the door and walked me straight into Clancy's office. So I come in with this big thing of flowers and he, go, and he, he goes, you brought me flowers. And I was just, and I said, this is not how I was told this was going to go. <laughs> that was an awkward situation. But um, it was it was literally supposed to have been like a 45-minute meet and greet, and I was there for like five hours, and his wife went out and got us lunch, and um, it's fantastic. And, you know, it, I had a really, really – and it was, it was not lost on me. I'm sitting in Tom Clancy's office. We're talking about, you know, fifth-generation Chinese fighter jet, jet engines and stuff like that, and I'm going, I'm having this conversation with, with Tom Clancy. It's like I wish my dad could see this. That's insane. Yeah. It was his office what I would, I, it's, what I'm imagining in my yeah, head with all total, you, if you pictured it, you know, it's a very, um, his, his wife designed the whole house and you go in his office and it's all like very sort of, uh, nautical and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, he had ball caps, you know, on the shelves behind him and you just about exactly what you would expect it to look like. Do you consider Tom a mentor in ways? Did, I mean, did you learn, did you, did you just, did you soak up what he was putting out? Yes. I mean, I honestly feel like I learned more from just living his books and reading his yes. books. The first time I talked to him, he was saying like, uh, well, it was about seals. He, he was saying the best line I ever put in one of my books is blah, blah, blah. And it was something about something else. And I was like, I'm going to have to disagree with you because without remorse, Good. I said the best line I've ever seen in any book is uh, John Clark he said he was in the Navy, and, and they, they said, what were you on? He's like, my belly most of the time. <laughs> and I just thought it was just such a, a cool line. Just as a writer, you go, okay, so much is accomplished with that those that one few line. little words, yeah. you know, and that, that's how you do it. it but, I mean, for most of the guys you've met in special operations, they're that way. Yeah. They always give you some yeah. sort of snide exactly. half answer is what exactly. I call it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what was it like to, to, to pick up that series? I mean, it wasn't you, – you took it as if it was your own. But, I mean, at the end of the day, Jack Ryan wasn't your creation like Court Gentry right. was. Yeah, so I did uh, three books with Tom before mm -hmm. he passed away. And he passed away right after we wrote Command Authority in 2013. And um, it was about Russia in invading Ukraine and taking Crimea. And, um, and then that happened in February of the next year. And Tom, sadly, had passed away. But they, they came to me really quickly and, and asked me if I, wanted, if I could continue the series. And... They said, also, we'd like to do two Tom Clancy books next year, um, and we'd like you to write both of them. So I took a year off from Gray Man, and I did two Clancy books in 2014. So it was all Clancy, and I, was, I went to, um, I think for that one, I went to China and, and uh, Hong Kong and um, spent a, most of the year up in D.C. You know, just to, talking to people. And uh, then I, I, I love doing it. It's very different from the Gray Man series. Like, <laughs> I've never – everybody's like, how do you, you know, keep them apart? And that's just never been a problem for me. Like, when I was working on a Clancy book, 
it was this world. When I was working on Gray Man, it was this world. And there's just sort of a different view in my head about the both of them. And I, and I, I don't think I ever wrote a scene where Jack Ryan did a court gentry thing or a court yeah. gentry scene where he, he was... Let me, so let me give you my perspective on the two. Let me know if mm-hmm. it's sort of accurate. I mean, Jack Ryan is sort of the cookie cutter, former military, yeah. like very proper yet can step into the tactical world if need be, yeah. but he's not the tactical expert in, in a lot of ways. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. And, and he's, more, he's more your farm. Yeah. He, he graduated from the farm. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, his backstory, he was a history professor and, um, you know, started working for the CIA. And I, uh, you know, I know what it's like to write a long series <laughs> like Clancy did. Now mm-hmm. I know. I didn't know that. Um, and so your guy who every now and then has to, you know, get thrown into the, the, the meat grinder. Well, you got, you have to do that in every book. You have to sort of top yourself in each book. So the straight lace guy that's walking the halls of, you know, the old executive office building or whatever is in every book. He's like, you know, parachuting or, or <laughs> whatever, whatever happens. But I mean, that's how, that's how you keep these series going and fresh. And court is the guy you send in to do the, the yeah. dirty work. Yeah. Yeah. will never be acknowledged in a, in a lot of ways. Correct. Yeah. yeah. I, I just sort of created him as this guy that was sort of just ma- almost manufactured by his father, who was a, uh, like a firearms instructor and um, gets, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. You write things like when I wrote Gray Man, I'd never spoken to anybody at CIA. I'd never spoken to anybody in the SEALs or anything like that. This is early on. I was shooting a lot. So actually, I probably dealt with these people, but I didn't tell anybody I was writing a book. Mm-hmm. So you kind of get stuck with things that you wrote in your first book that, like, in book 12, you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense yeah, whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you can't really undo it. You know, it's like these uh, – but, you know, it's it's the thing with the movie. There's, there's aspects of the movie where I'm going like, oh – People would call me out for that, but it's a movie, so it's, you can get away with it. Yeah, you know, I'm interested in that, but I, I think I I gravitate towards Court mm-hmm. uh, by nature of just his 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 personality. Yeah, and one I didn't graduate from the Naval Academy. Yeah, right, right. And I wasn't. You I wasn't, a I wasn't professor. I wasn't the uh, <laughs> the uh, the combed over hair, uh, very uh, <laughs> uh, officer looking guy. I was prior enlisted, so uh, there's a dirty aspect uh, of me. <laughs> um, how I mean, how much research? do you do going into a book? Um, Cause I mean, I mean, I, I assume you're watching international affairs, you're watching the news and reading nonstop. Yeah. And then you're probably looking at what crime syndicates are doing cartels yeah. and, and you're trying to weave that all. I mean, what's the process you, you utilize to go into that? Cause I mean, I, I think I could write one thriller and then I would be done. They'd be like, Hey, we want two more. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, I'm tapped out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You say that, but it's like, I'm so fascinated by that these worlds, you know. So if I'm writing something about the Russian mafia and I'm looking at the nexus between the Russian mafia and the Russian government, mm-hmm. and I'll I'll just I'll dig deeper and deeper and I'll find something and I just want to like scream it to the world. And that's when you know it's got to go in your book. Not to be preachy, but just because it's like, well this is fascinating. And I think a skill that I have is that I can read, you know, some 230 page government publication that's just as boring as you can imagine or some think tank thing and find that one little nugget in there and go well, that's kind of cool you know and and work that into a story so you have to do is you know the research I, I try and create like a, a rough outline for a book and then just put the outline aside and then just write from there and and just do the research as needed I don't do all the re- you hear some authors they do all the research and they plot out each chapter and then they go write it and that sounds like a great thing to do but I on I'm, paper yeah, yeah on paper my brain just does not work that way it's just this foggy amorphous uh thing that comes together and I will just very quickly go like oh I wonder if there's a Russian mafia group in Belarus that um you know steals cars you know and you, you start doing a deep dive into that and you, you find something that's close enough or whatever oh they all, don't steal all, cars all open source yeah so everything, all, uh, everything Google yeah internet how, absolutely how, you know you said you went to China are you accepted into the intelligence communities now? I mean, will they talk to you openly or, or more, do they ever reach out? No, I mean, state departments reached out about stuff. And a lot of times it's to have me not just state department, but other like think tanks and stuff. They'll ask me to come give a talk on something that was in a book that I wrote a year ago. And I think I I don't want to, I don't want to, 
put myself up as the expert, you know, there's no stolen valor with me, you know, I'm like, I, I learned what I need to learn, you know, to put on the page. And, and that's where it is. So um, I, I don't I, I talk to people in the intelligence community, um, mostly retired or, mm -hmm. or former. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I've been to the Pentagon many times, DIA and ODI and, and, and places like that. And I've had great conversations with people, all super open source and, and all that. But you know, so much of what I derive from that is just learning the way people talk, learning what people think about, just the atmospherics of the location and, you know, the security to get into the building is fascinating to me. And, and all those little things that just makes your, make your book feel more real, you know, sights and sounds and smells. And I'm really, you know, focused on all that. And, uh, you know, I can, there's a lot of stuff I can learn just from reading a book. But when I, when I go to those places and when I talk to those people, it's like, I want to get to know them a yes. little bit, you know? And, and you also, in terms of methodology, I mean, you've flown in the back of an F-18, uh, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you're, you're actually doing tactical training, medical, yeah. uh, tactical med medical yeah. training or medicine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I've done all that. Um, I'm, just getting back into shooting, just writing two books a year. It's, it, you know, it's, you know what a perishable skill it is. And, yeah. and I do some training down in Mississippi at uh, a really good place. And uh, which is down there and I was going like, okay, I, I need to just find the time to get back into this a little bit more. So I just joined a new. What are you train in Memphis or can you say? Uh, well, uh, Memphis Sports Shooting Association, okay. MSSA. Um, and uh, there's a Range USA. There's, 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 yeah. other, there's other places, but uh, there's a place down in Holly Springs. Um, which is really good. And I've taken some actual organized classes there and I've just gone down there to shoot with friends. And um, yeah, and it, I, I, sh I should do more. Again, I, I don't try and put myself up. I just have to be good enough about it to talk about it and to be safe when I do it. Obviously, um, when I first started taking these classes, there were a lot of active duty people in there and, you know, they realized that, you know, I was the dude that wants to be a writer. <laughs> and so <laughs> there was like literally, you know, like they would, you know, call out like cover and then they would like shout to me grainy gun on safe and stuff like that yep. they like add that call and i'm like I, I got you i'm not gonna i may be slow and uh i got a bad back but i, I, I think I, that's I, just like precautionary until no, they know no, you're like I okay get he's up to speed yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I felt like i was sort of a mascot there I, I, this one school i went so many times took so many classes yeah. you know every time uh, people tell me they they can shoot i'm like okay you know i i, I take people at their word mm -hmm. and uh my wife and my mother-in-law and father-in-law, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we've, we've all shot before. We're good. Mm -hmm. And we went to the range. This had to be like uh, two, three months ago. And um, I, I forget the name of the range. It's a small one, indoor. And so they'd bought in pistols, and I bring my pistol, and, and it, was, it was pretty fucking bad. And to the <laughs> point where the, the range safety officer oh, wow. saw uh, them shooting and came behind them. I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm, I, I got him. <laughs> but I'm just going to say uh, – <laughs> There was a, uh, oh no, uh, a chamber check like this. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay, let's let's put that down, and yeah. then uh, Jordan will kill me for saying this. Jordan's my wife. Uh, she had some grip that was. I'm like, oh, okay, and I'm trying to teach them grip, and I'm like, okay, hey, you know what? We need to all go through a range safety class. Yeah. Let's just let's go do the classroom yeah. portion first. I'll, I'll set up a class. Yeah, we'll, yeah. Well, it was. Uh, yeah, it's it's all fundamentals. I mean, <laughs> it was it was bad, um, <laughs> embarrassing. Uh, yeah, and, and I do want to get my wife to your point. Yeah, like, trained up where she can have a small, yeah, you know, concealed, yeah, uh, Glock or, or Sig. Right. What is your pistol of choice? I'm um, I'm carrying the 365 XD with a hollow sun on it right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm I'm just I'm, I'm a big Glock fan. It's just a little bulky. I just have a I have a third generation Glock 19 that yeah. I've had to have put fifty thousand rounds, maybe seventy five thousand rounds through. And um, you know, I I say it's it, it is the the most dependable device I have ever owned. Yeah. <laughs> forget forget yes. weapon, you know, thing yes. that I've ever owned. So I mean, it, I like that, but I I like everything. But right now I'm, I'm carrying the 365 XD, and I yeah. like it a lot. I you know I I find it's a especially if you come from the military. XL. And what I find I find mass fascinating is, you know, you and Tom have one thing in common, and you guys didn't come from the military. Correct. Yeah. Yet you write better stories than than we could come up with. You know, there, there's a lot of really good military writers, but I have I have learned there's a lot of people in the military that almost don't see what the cool stuff is. And I've I've had these conversations with people, and they'll be very focused on telling me about this one thing, and I'm like, okay, okay, okay. 
And then they'll be like, yeah, and then we blew out a gun port over here. And I'm like, wait, you did what? He's like, yeah, we blew gun port to shoot. I was like, all right, let's talk about that for a while. You know, it's like, let's not talk about, you know, the, the comms between the uh, predator feed and the, you know, it's, yeah. it's like um, I, I was ghostwriter in, in my career for two books with a, a military guy who was fantastic person. I can't say who it was. Um, my name's not on the book or anything. Just a wonderful person. And um, I had I had written some the first few pages, and it was a, a joint special operations mission. And here I am, a guy that you know bartended till he was thirty one. But you know, I'd, I'd read uh, <laughs> whatever the book on Delta Force <laughs> written by yes, a, you know, and um, and and I gave him the first few pages, and he's like, yeah, well, actually, his call sign you know, with the Reaper guy would be different from here and they would call him this and that. And I was like, I can't give this guy six names in the first five pages. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, it, it's like, I have to tell the story in a way that's empathetic to the reader and the reader gets everything. And so I think a lot of military people are, are so focused on it. They don't sort of know how to be empathetic to the, to the layman. To who's predominantly based off society today, what is it, the 99% and have not yeah. served to yeah. the 1%? That, yeah. And that makes total sense. Uh, yeah, I think you're talking about Delta Force with Charlie Beckwith, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the founder, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then, uh, you know, Richard uh, Marcinko, mm -hmm. who re recently passed yeah. uh, with his books. Yeah. And, and I remember reading his book, um, and I couldn't make it past the, the first, like, 20 pages. I remember that. Because I, yeah. I, I was a recon Marine thinking about switching over to the SEALs, and he's uh -huh. talking about how his guys didn't recognize that they actually had training rounds, dummy rounds, mm -hmm. in uh, in the mags, which technically wouldn't fire unless you have the BFA yeah. on the end of, uh, uh, you know, the, the device yeah. that allows you to, yeah, yeah. to fire the blanks. Um, which right there, I'm like, okay. But he was writing it for the layman who would not right. understand that. So right. he must have had an advisor or a ghostwriter saying, hey, you know, you can't. Yeah, dial it back a little bit yeah. to where it, it's it's – it's, you can get so lost in the weeds and, you know, people will be like, are there, are there guys like court gentry out there? And I'm like, <laughs> you know, we've seen CIA operations that have come to light, you know, like the thing in Italy, with they roll the guy up. It's like, there's like 25 people involved, you know, and yeah. me, I've got one dude that goes and kidnaps a guy, rolls him up in a carpet and gets him out of the country. It's like, it's not really the same thing. It's, it, it, we call it the mythology versus the reality. Sure. Cause there's a lot of mythology about special operations yeah. or the intelligence communities or these other communities that yeah. exist. Yeah. Um, and, and I think where it hinders us is that we we're like, no, that's just not the reality. Right. And we focus on the reality and we are very, uh, conformative in a lot of ways yeah. and, uh, we can be very, uh, black and white, but, uh, no, no, no. I, what, I mean, everyone grows up off your books and it, it allows people to, to, to be court gentry. Yeah. And who doesn't want to be. Court Gentry or, or yeah. Jason Bourne or, or Jack Ryan as a, as a kid growing up. I write wish fulfillment for myself, you know, and, and, and hope, hopefully the people that read it, are they, they like that stuff too, you know. It's like retribution of a real bad guy, you know, by somebody who's got a good heart but yes. is, you know, I, I never wanted to make my character one of those like square jawed, does everything right. He's got a lot of vulnerabilities or whatever. And Boring. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, I just think it's just more interesting if, if there's skin in the game for the hero because you know they're not going to die. Yeah. Um, I mean, they might die, but, you know, they're, they're not going to die. If, if I've got a three book deal, they're not going to yeah. die. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, we focus on the mythology versus reality yeah. a lot. Uh, I've, I've had some buddies that uh, advised mm -hmm. as military advisors on films. Yeah. And when I do talk to them, they're all pissed off. They're like, it's, it's so unreal. And I've yeah. advised them to do, and you're yeah. like, bro, it's, yeah. it's Hollywood. At the yeah. end of the day, they have to sell films. Yeah. And I, I read somewhere that, uh, you know, the old 1930s things where the cops have the guns up by their face when they're going around, they're going like, that's just so they could have their face and the gun in the shot, you know? And, and then that becomes like the, the way that people think things are done. And I'm sure there's 10,000 examples of that. Well, it, you know, at the end of the day too, Hollywood and in the books that you, you write in, in all the books that came out of Vietnam, those are the greatest recruiting tools for the military. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't come from the military lineage. Yeah. But when you watch, you know, The Rock right. and the SEALs come in the through Rock. the sewer yeah. and they're killed by the Force Recon yeah, Raids yeah. And, all, and all those mil or, or, or platoon. Yeah. Um, no matter how, how how badly that paints the uh, the army in that generation. Yeah. But um, if you're 18 when you watch it, that's a, maybe a slightly different thing. Yeah. So, but yeah. you're like, I, I just want to, I want to, I want to sense what right. those guys sense. And that's, yeah. it, in a lot of ways, it's, uh, 
it, you know, Hollywood does a lot of service to the to, to the military, even if they don't intend. Yeah, absolutely. These days, absolutely. Um, I, I'm surprised DOD and the intelligence communities don't reach out to you more because one of the things that I think they lack is again conformity is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, but conformity can crush independent thinking or innovative, disruptive thinking. Mm. And, you know, as I'm thinking about it, like when we had certain problem sets, like, hey, call, call Mark, <laughs> let, let's bring him in, have him sign, yeah. you know, necessary yeah. things. Don't give him all the details he needs, but say, hey, how would you go about uh, doing this? And it's amazing. I mean, let me, let me give you an example. We, we did a disruptive uh, workshop and we had people from all like professions mm -hmm. and it was the most interesting group and some of the ideas they came up with were just just off looking the at wall. it from different angles yes. that, you, that you would be able to exactly. Yeah, I, I've heard that. I think like Vince Flynn and maybe Brad Thor had do, had done like red cell stuff before, and um, you know you know the term. I, yeah, yeah. I, I felt I, I've I've read that that's happened. <clears throat> um, nobody's come to me. Um, I wish I could like wink into the camera right now, and <laughs> but and then it was really nobody's come to me. Not not that we can mention. <laughs> um, so with the with the deals, because you you're turning out a book pretty much every year now, right? I turn out a gray man book every year, and a lot of times another book. So I've been doing I've done twenty three books in fourteen years. So. Do so I mean, how much lead time do they give you? Do they give you like 12, 12 months of the day? Hey, we need another book. Twelve months to yeah today. yeah. So a gray man book comes out every February, and there is artwork and a pre order link before I've written the first word. So the the title, the artwork, and the pre-order link on Amazon. Who comes up with the title? I, usually I do. I've, okay. I, I've had them turned down before, and I'll either come up with something else. My editors come up with a few titles. Um, uh, I've come up with all but about two or three, and I came up with a, some of the Clancy ones that I did on yes. my own, um, and I think there were some that I didn't come up with. Do you keep a a notebook or a video or voice recorder just where you throw ideas randomly into it? Or, I mean, do you have, like, it's, I'm almost thinking of the, the movie Elf. Remember, remember the, the yeah, scene yeah. where they bring in the, 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 yeah, yeah, the little guy? Peter Dinklage, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, hey, and he's got like a book. He's got the ideas. book and they find yeah. his book. <laughs> do, 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 I mean, do you have, how, how do you, how do you take the ideas that, again, because I know you, you, you put a medical term on it, you're, you're always daydreaming. Do you put that down on paper whenever you come up with an idea? Yeah, I have an app called Evernote and yes. um, everything goes into that. Sometimes it's audio, sometimes it's a picture of something, sometimes it's, you know, I'll, I'll just make little notes. I've got like a... Right now, I've got a list going because I have a, a, a British guy, an SAS guy in a gray man book I'm writing now, like a grizzled, older SAS guy. And I'm just listening to podcasts of different things, and I'll just hear some little British saying, you know, kind of badass British saying, and, I, and I'll be like, this is Ren's lines. And these are lines I want to use in the book just to make it, like, really accurate. And, and I'll have hundreds of those things. If a layman saw your notes, would they be like, this guy's, like, certifiable yeah they, you couldn't i feel i really feel like if you saw one of my books 95 percent done you would think this is completely unpublishable it's not until way into the edits where the book really makes much sense and and <clears throat> if you looked at my notes i don't think you'd make really heads or tails out of it because i you know i but yeah I, i've been writing on planes on legal pads and it's sort of like you know the embassy is attacked at 2.23 a.m. You know, and you're writing this stuff, the whole, and you're going like, I wonder if who's looking at this. Do, do your, uh, does your wife, your wife and your, your kids, are they like, oh, dad's writing something down again? I mean, are, do you just, at the oddest times, you'll be like, oh, idea. Yeah, my, my wife will help point out that I'm kind of not here, you know, <laughs> that, that sort of thing, because I'll start thinking about it. And um, and uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll make notes that the kids are, more or less oblivious to it. They went and mm -hmm. saw the Gray Man movie when it came out, and they, they loved it. Like, they all have friends that like me. Uh, like, you know, so they, they, some kid wants a signed book or whatever, and I do that, but it's like, that's that's all they care about. Um, but, yeah, my wife reads them, and, um, but, yeah, she does see, she'll, she'll point out when I'm not terribly focused, and I'm like, yeah, my head, it's, I'm, I'm in Libya right now. I'm sorry, I'll get right back <laughs> with you or whatever. When, when you get into the writing process, I mean, you, you go deep, you know, you're on a timeline yeah. and that sort of sucks. I, I, I don't know if that disrupts your process uh, or motivates you, but I, I mean, I, it motivates me. I, I hate it. But if I didn't, if I didn't have the deadlines, I'd be, it would so never get to, yeah. I'm the same way. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, like, give me a due date. Yeah. And it's not to say I'm not going to start writing it like yeah. a week before and, yeah. and, and jam. But I mean, are you, are you like seven and 8am till like 
6 p.m. riding? How, how does that work for you? Now? For, for me, um, it's changed now. So I got married two and a half years ago, and now I have three stepkids. So before Congrats. that, it yeah. was pretty much me. <laughs> yes. And uh, and I had two dogs now, four <laughs> dogs, and uh, the dogs are older, and they all have 26 minutes. dogs came from both sides of the relationship? Yeah, yeah. How, two, how are they two, all two, doing? They're doing really good. Um, they, they, they get along really well together. They gang up on other dogs at the dog park sometimes. You know, they, yeah. they, they get in that pack mentality, and none of those dogs would hurt anybody, but, you know, when – 225 pounds of dog come charging and barking up at you. It, it That's going to make you good. cry a little. You're like, yeah. yeah, they're coming together. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're totally they're gelling. They're totally coming together. But um, yeah, I, I, my process before, I mean, I, I would start at 5, 530 in the morning all the time. I remember I'd look up coffee shops and like, oh, that place doesn't open until 6. It's like, oh, forget So you got to get outside the house. I can't do it as much anymore in Memphis. I have my own office, which is like detached from our house. It's mm-hmm. like a pool house that mm-hmm. we turn in my office. Um, I used to always, I wrote my first 10 books at Starbucks or some other coffee shop, but now enough people know who I am. And I, I hasten to add, it's not like I'm such a star. It's more like, hey, you need to write a book about my oh, hairdresser true, or annoying. whatever. So, yeah. you know, it's like, and a lot of them are really <laughs> nice people, but, you know, it's like, it, that can't be your office. <laughs> people yeah. can just sit down and start talking to you all the time. So when I'm out of town, um, I, yes. was at, I was at a Starbucks like a block away a little while ago. No um, kidding. Yeah, from here. And um I, I love to to get out and somehow I'll just put headphones on rain in my headphones the sound of rain and I just uh, I I dial in really well doing that no kidding yeah really so you basically me. white noise yeah just white noise yeah yeah I, you know <clears throat> I've written two books that mm-hmm. no one has ever heard about that's okay that's not true. Uh, my my mom has bought all 500 <laughs> copies and I've given them to her friends but you know COVID was the and, and I say this I know COVID a lot of people passed away from COVID sure for me in terms of actually getting the writing done, COVID mm-hmm. was was great in the sense that I woke up at 6 a.m. I was writing until 6 p.m. It took, took a lot of things off the table. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was nothing else to do. We yeah. were also drinking, I don't know why my wife and I got into like mimosas. Uh-huh. We were drinking like two bottles between the two of us like every day for like 14 days. We're like, okay, this is this has got to stop. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I probably had to go back and edit a lot of the, uh, the writing out. <laughs> but um, funny enough, when we wrote it, uh, the talent war, uh, because we knew it had to go through a DOD review. Right. We, I was very cautious not to like special operations. Sure. I talked about other units. Yeah. It was a highly specialized and highly selective unit left yeah. into that. And it got approved within like a month and a half. Really? It was rapid. Oh and my gosh. You hear surprised. horror stories, uh, sometimes about those things. Well, that's cause my comrades use words that they're not supposed to use. Yeah. And I understand what my books, the difference is my book was not the, we, we call it the I Love Me books. Yeah. Uh, so there I was surrounded by Yeah, the, right? oh, like, I Love I, Me books. I like that. I, I could never do that. And there is a place for it. Mm-hmm. Um, I know the community frowns on it, but guess what? Those books also recruit the next generation of, of kids, whether you like it or not. Right, yeah. Um, but uh, they, they, they go into war details where I was talking about the assessment and selection yeah. process. Right. Which is unclass yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I've had friends that... Uh, yeah, it, like a year or two years before it got through DOD, and it was a lot of it was redacted and said, no, you got to change this, you got to change this. Yeah, I, I I used to say this, and this isn't a dig on, on all those books, but I, I used to say, like, in my opinion, <coughs> Navy SEALs and former Navy SEALs overestimate how much the average person wants to hear about them doing push-ups. You know, it's like, that's, the, you know... <sighs> going to Hell Week, but it's like... And then, then we bust out another 350, and... and uh, and it's, I'm like, I'm, I need some plot. <laughs> I need some plot in here. It, you, you know, going through buds for me, because I was a recon Marine prior to that, and mm-hmm. I was a scout sniper. Yeah. Uh, one of my Marine uh, mentors uh, discharged me as a sergeant, commissioned me as an ensign. He was a, a, a major in the, the Marine Corps at the time. I, or, you know, he might have been a lieutenant colonel. But he basically looked at me and said, hey, Mike, can I give you a piece of advice? I'm like, yeah. He's like, if you quit buds, you'll embarrass the entire Marine Corps. Oh, we, wow. were, we were laughing. Yeah. But there's also a truth of ounce and right. a uh, yeah. joke. So it wasn't like Buds was just like, hey, let's get this over. The war's on. Yeah. Like, I, I, oh, I know yeah. where I need to be. And yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, a lot of guys talk with Buds. Um, but I'll find the ones that talk about Buds. And, and again, this isn't a hit. They served their country. Yeah. Didn't have much combat experience. Yeah. And they go back to that one thing, Buds. Yeah. Like, Buds was tough. Yeah. But I had also done basic reconnaissance course. Right. Marine OCS. It yeah. was just like, again, it was just like a checklist I needed to knock right. through. 
I couldn't expedite the, the timeline. Yeah. Let's get this done. I want to get to my yeah. SEAL team and let's let's yeah. move forward. But and, I, and I do think a lot of those books, <clears> um, like you said, they're great recruitment tools, but also they're really inspir- inspirational for, for young males, maybe even that don't go into the military. Like David Goggins, you're not going to be David Goggins, but yeah. you, you can see that potential and go, wow, I, I can do more than I, I could do. And I, so I, you know, I think there's a, there's a benefit for that. It, especially for an era where some kids don't have both parents in the house yeah. or they don't have a male yeah. dominant or dominant male uh, influence yeah. in yeah. their lives. Yeah. And, and uh, frankly, there's some, there's some toxic sort of male, uh, you know, role model stuff, you know, that you can go out there and find on TikTok or YouTube or whatever. I'm too old for it, but I've seen little bits of it and, uh, in, you know, not helpful <laughs> in, in making a, a, a good, strong, you know, personality of, of a man. You, you know, you were, speaking about current times, it, it really two questions pop up. How is the current domestic situation in such a divided nation? I mean, are, is that giving you fuel for the next few books? Or, or is woke killing court gentry in the sense that, oh, he's, he's toxic masculinity, like, yeah, embodied? You know, I do get things... I, you get little things, and, and and you, but you see all sides because I get so much. I, I call it reader mail because you can't call it fan mail because some yes. of these people are not fans. <laughs> um, most are, but I mean, you get people uh, that criticize things, and sometimes it is a little like too woke. In, in my new book, there's two major female characters who are both on the right side of things, but they don't get along. And so I've read several things where people are going like, "Oh, it's such a male thing that the women can't get along," and I'm like. No, there's very specific reasons they can't get along. She didn't trust her boss because her boss tried to kill this person, and so that she doesn't trust her. And and it's it's part of the story arc to where they don't get along, and then they need each other, you know. And so it's like, you know, you, it's where you find it on the sto- story arc. And I, I remember uh, a book I did a, a, gen- a gray man book about Mexico um, ballistic, and somebody said, you know, it was completely racist because the gray man says this thing about the Mexican Civil War, like, what's wrong with you people? Well, he says that so that the Mexican can answer back, like, yeah, you guys would never have a civil war. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, you know? yeah. And so it was basically to make him put egg on the hero's face. But since I used that line, they'd be like, well, it's completely, you know, bigoted against Mexicans. It's like, no, it, it, it was it was a setup. So you do get the the people that are looking to tear it up or whatever. When it comes to American politics, I just stay clear of it because yeah. it's just not, you know, I'm, I don't don't get in the the mud with the. Pigs. I'm I am literally on a boat in the between two <laughs> shores and yes. and, and on it. on either side in so many ways. I'm like super pro Second Amendment, but I'm also kind of libertarian, so I don't really care about some of these social issues. You, you just you, you just basically summarized me. I, I was on a <laughs> okay. podcast yesterday in Miami uh, uh, with Tommy for MSCS uh, Media, but I'm like, hey, listen, at the end of the day, you know. Uh, I'm like, I'm, I'm probably more libertarian than anything. I believe yeah. in small government. Yeah. Uh, you know, I love Reagan's yeah. quote, the nine most dangerous words in the English language. Yeah. I'm here. I'm yeah. with the government. I'm here to help. I'm here to help. I'm like, and, and I served in the government for yeah. 20 years. So right. I, I think I have the luxury or, or at least the, the ability to say that. But yeah. uh, we also talked about the 2A community mm-hmm. and I'm like, don't, you don't mess with the 2A community. Yeah. And I understand the, the, the issues with gun violence, especially within schools and children. I, I, I hear that. Yeah. Um, and I think it's more nuanced than that. But yeah, uh, I also give him a perspective. I, again, I, I, Andy Stumpf told me about this, um, that the 2A community is probably the one thing that would keep the Chinese from invading. Mm. He said, how yeah. many how many hunting tags in yeah. Texas? And I think he heard this from, from I think, Evan Hafer, the, uh, the founder CEO of Black Rifle Coffee. But I guess 10 million hunting tags are sold in Texas alone. Wow. 600,000 in South Carolina. Wow. I mean, yeah. you go on for every state, for Utah, for, for yeah. Wyoming, for, for, for Montana. Yeah. Uh, it is a huge demographic, and I understand yeah. the framing of the Constitution, but our domestic policies are creating a very interesting international stage right now. Yeah. I mean, you've got to be sal- salivating at that. I mean, this is, uh, like, nobody knows where this is going to go. Saudi yeah. Arabia is coming off the U.S. dollar, as is China, Russia, yeah. and they're forming a... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, a security alliance that yeah. that's huge yeah and, and you look at china and africa i'm doing a book later this year a non-gray man book there's a, another series that i'm working on uh that involves china and africa and um I'm hoping to go to ghana uh in the, in late summer early fall and um and you and you go like wow and and honestly china in latin america um uh russia in 
developing nations trying to, you know, increase their sort of presence as, as a hedge. So it's, you know, you, you, I'm old enough to remember the whole domino theory of communism and all this other stuff. It's not the same thing, but it's also, it is a little bit of history repeating a, a, a little bit. And it's, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of fodder to write about, but that also means that these are, these are troubling times. Africa is, a, I think Africa is going to be one of the next battlegrounds. Again, yeah. not direct combat, but yeah. more your, 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 your Cold War. I mean, yeah. basically China, while we were involved with the global war on terror, was buying up all of Africa. I yeah. remember they, they, yeah. they basically bought the port yeah. of Djibouti, which was one of yeah. our key ports Absolutely, yeah. for the U.S. Navy, as well as uh, Camp Lemonier, yeah. uh, the base there. Yeah. And then, you know, the, the final straw is you better keep nice with Mexico because Mexico could just, you know, China can come in and say, hey, 50, 50 yeah. billion, yeah. what do you want us to build? Get right on the border. Yeah, yeah. that's true. That's true. Let's talk about Grayman. Um, so how does that process work? Did they go to your publishers to say, hey, we want to buy the rights to, to the, Grayman? For the film? Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I optioned the rights in Hollywood a month before the book came out in 2009. So it's been in Hollywood for all when, those years. When you say you've you optioned the rights, yeah. is that the, the option the rights to go uh, pitch it to to? Yeah. So I a a film agent read my literary agent's like one line blurb about what the book was going to be out like a year before the book came out. It was in um, Publishers Weekly magazine. It's like about uh, about a uh, former CIA agent who has to officer not agent. Um, the movie messed me up for that. A uh, former CIA officer who has to run a gauntlet through Europe to save two little girls. Yeah. And um, and so this film agent read that and said, hey, can you send me a copy of this on this manuscript, which hadn't been edited or whatever? So he sent it. And he, you know, I, I got, as I said, it was a paperback book, very small advance. You know, I was just barely, my fingernails on the bottom rung of the yeah. literary world. But I was hearing that people in Hollywood were interested in it. And, um I never thought for a second they'd make a movie, but I wanted to sell the rights. And it, that's the rights for a studio to make the film. And then they pay you a bunch of money if they make the film. Yes. They give you okay. a little bit of money so they have three years to, you know, put it together. And if it doesn't happen after three years, they can try to ex extend the rights or they come back to you. And um, and it wasn't – I mean, it was, a, it was a good amount of money. It was more than I got as advance for the book. But to me, the, the main benefit was I'm this – little schmuck from Memphis th with a little paperback and I can go, yeah, Hollywood picked it up. You know, the new Regency studios, it was the first one that had it They're They're developing it for a film. I never thought anything was going to come out of it, but I was like, that's just a cool thing to be able to say. So it bounced around there for five years or so. And then it came ba back to the rights came back to me and immediately everybody was bombarding me. I was doing, um, it's like instant credibility almost. Yeah. My, my agent in Hollywood was like, okay, Channing Tatum's people want to talk to you and this group wants to talk to you and, and Sony and all this other stuff. And and we went with Sony and the Russo brothers and, and uh, almost instantly yeah. the Russo brothers had me come out to LA. And, well, I did a conference call with them when they were trying to, you know, they were pitching me how they wanted to do it. And uh, and I like, you know, afterwards I was, tell, I was telling my buddy afterwards, I was like, I think they like that book more than I do. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. Um, and... But then it, it just sort of died on the vine for a while, and the Russo stepped away because they were doing all the Marvel films, which, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. one can forgive them. And then for a while, um, Sony was developing it with Charlize Theron to play Port Gentry and, and switch the whole thing to a female character, um, which would not have worked well for me as the author because you couldn't put the star's face on the cover of the book and yes. put it out. And, and, um, and they wrote a script that was so completely different from, and it wasn't just that it was a female lead. It, I, it was a good script. I was like, I'd, I'd go see that movie, but it has nothing to do with my book. So what, what in terms of rights, what rights did you have to say, no, no, we're not, we're not going to do that I had no rights. So once it went to you know, Sony, they had, uh, I guess, three years mm -hmm. to, um, to develop it any way they wanted to. And, yeah, I, I have no rights. Unless you're Stephen King and or – you know, maybe John Grisham yeah. or something like that. So I, I, I get emails all day long, every day going like, you should use this actor in the next one or you just know, randoms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A, a, a lot of people go, um, you know, nobody knows what the gray man looks like. So you need to have an unknown actor. I'm like, I don't think you know how $200 million movies yeah, are made. Yes, they're, yes. they're, they're looking for some, you know, marquee people. So, um, yeah, so I really know rights at all. And, um, you know, it's, 
it's not selling out. I mean, what, I, I want this commercial out for my books that I'm writing, and, and the books are still the books, even though the movies are different. How, how does the re-release of the book with, because is Ryan Gosling's face on it? Uh-huh. Uh, and Chris Evans. Yeah. And Chris Evans? Yeah. How does that usually work? Do you retain all the rights on that? You just can use those images? Yes. Because I've seen that with multiple books. What's the, the one that just came out for Jack Carr? What's the series? Uh, oh, Terminal List. Terminal List. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, uh, yeah. and what's that actor? Chris, Chris Pratt, Pratt is yeah. on it. Yeah. Does that usually stay, those rights stay with the uh, the author? Yeah. It's, uh, um, it's called the movie tie-in version or mm-hmm. the MTI. Mm-hmm. And, and they, like Netflix, had to give their approved image to the publisher to use on the cover. And um, and that I don't think anybody paid for that. I mean, I think that just just it's a part ne- of the yeah deal. yeah, and it's good for Netflix because it brings awareness to the, and it's definitely good for for the publisher and me. What what? So did the sales post release of the movie uh, surpass the original release? Sure. Oh sure. Oh, oh yeah. yeah yeah. Well, the original release. Um, when it came out, it, it did really well like in independent bookstores because a lot of people were kind of like pumping it up and hand selling it. And it, yes. and it had been in some like trade magazines like, mm-hmm. hey, this is like a just totally outlandish, like over the top thing that, you know, certain segments going to love. So it did. I, I had a really nice release back in 2009 when it came out. Yes. I, people had always told me it would take you years to earn back your advance. And I was ready for that. And um, the first time, uh, you know, the first pay period or whatever. I, I got all this money that was more than the advance. I'm, I went to my agent. I was like, I think something's wrong. He's like, no, no, you sold this many books. So you, that's insane. You, yeah. So uh, it, it did well when it started, but I mean, now it, the beautiful thing they call it in the industry, they call it the long tail when you have a whole bunch of other books out there. So when your new book comes out, people can buy 11 more in the series. If they, if they learn about you through this book, well, when the movie comes out and I already had 11 gray man novels out, I mean, that was really good for me, obviously, because the, the movie tie-in edition of The Gray Man obviously, obviously sold, but that got more people enjoying the books, and that got more people, um, you know, picking up the, the long tail, all these. I didn't think about that. Yeah. So some people pick up book number six, yeah. love it, and they're like, oh, I've got yeah. to go back. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and uh, I have friends that are authors that haven't had a lot of success with their first book or, you know, their first yeah. two books or whatever, and I'm like, guess what? It's... That book is out there, and when you land, when you hit something big, they um, come back. It they're going to come back and get that, and that's your intellectual property, and, you, and you're going to keep that. That's that's insane. Um, with regards to the the production of it, I mean, were you on scene for the filming of it? I was not. I had no connection whatsoever. I, I I talked to the Russo brothers every now and then, and yeah. and they did have me when they were working on the script because they wrote the first version of the script. Joe did. Um, they had me come out to LA and we talked character and where the story went and all that other stuff. And then I didn't really have any more input for five years. You know, I'm, I'm, I joke with Jack Carr cause I've been on his show yeah, before yes, yes. and I, I feel like multiple times Jack is like, so what was your involvement? Cause, cause he was He's trying I mean, to, he, he was like, hey, there. Yeah. He was there. He was like, he and Chris Pratt, I think got a room together. I mean, they, they, you know, they were like, you know two peas in a pod. And it wasn't like that for me at all. I, I met some of the actors at the premiere. Um, I was is that, the, is I was that in, when you first saw the, yeah. the final edit? Was that the premiere? Uh, no, I was in New York uh, about a month before the book came out and they arranged a screening for me, but it, they didn't have all the CGI done. So like yeah. scenes like he's falling out of an airplane, suddenly it turns to like cartoon. <laughs> like it looks like a cartoon for 10 seconds. Like that old aha video, you know what I'm talking mm-hmm. about? Um, mm-hmm. it, it was fascinating to, to see it that way. But so yeah, the, the premiere in LA was the second time I saw it. What was your initial thoughts? And I know you probably got to be cautious here. Um, when, when, when it was all said and done, I mean, did you feel like, Hey, and I'm sure you could chop it in many ways. Did, yeah. did Ryan Gosling represent the character? Well, yeah. overall did, you know, was, was the, 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 was it in line with your vision? Yeah. Well, so they, I'd gotten the script right as they started shooting. <clears throat> so I felt like I, you know, I, I knew what, was in for and I knew that this is different and this is the same and this character is actually playing this role and they sort of a lot of it makes sense being a writer I I understand and and like the bad the villain in my book there's actually two villains in the gray man Lloyd and this guy named Regal well they got rid of Regal and they turned Lloyd from this kind of lawyer to this big action hero because they got Chris Evans to make the movie. It like, makes a hundred percent sense to me. Yes. You know, it's like, of course, change the book, you know, because you're able to put that together. And, um, and so I, I liked it. Um, 
you know, there's little things that you can pick apart, calling, you know, calling everybody an agent, in, you know, which means something very different. And, uh, you know, I always say, like, the, the, there's this one scene in, in Prague where Gray Man is uh, handcuffed, and he's, he's fighting. To, to, the, to the bench. To the yeah, bench, yeah. yeah. And he's being attacked on all sides, and there's a dead cop, and he reaches over and pulls the dead cop over, pulls a frag grenade off the guy's belt and throws it. I'm going, like, what that's hard. Had, yeah. yeah, that's pretty hardcore, uh, the cops in Prague with frags. Um, but, I mean, it's a movie, right? And, uh, but I thought Ryan Gosling was perfect. Yeah. Absolutely perfect in the role. And I would argue with anybody that says he wasn't because the way that I write him, um, he's, he's understated. I, I felt like that. Off whole, the charts intelligent, but yeah. he plays the, the sort of aloof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and the relationship between him and the little girl could have been written really cheesy and smarmy in the movie, and it wasn't at all. It was very, um, it's, you would think it's how a guy like him would react, you mm-hmm. know, like mm-hmm. there, there's heart, but at the same time there's a distance and, and um, so I was really happy with that. I mean, the, the books are 50 times grittier, um, and that's okay that the movie's not because they needed the – they were going for this big mass appeal, so it was a little more Fast and Furious and a little less, um, you know, Black Hawk Down or, or mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. super – super or Extraction, um, mm-hmm. the super gritty film. Um, and But I, I, was, I was really happy with it, and uh, they're doing another one, and I'm excited about that, so – that's uh, that has got to be is that almost vindication like i've yeah. arrived well i never feel like i've arrived i have imposter Good. syndrome yeah no i never want to I, i'm always the thing that keeps me humble is the book i'm working on now sucks <laughs> and next year everybody's gonna find out how bad i am and uh i've been saying that for 13 years and someday i'm gonna be right <laughs> that that is so interesting because i look at my wife all the time and she's like what's wrong you should be proud about what you yeah. just accomplished i'm like i feel like a fucking imposter yeah I, yeah I, and i I know my background, yeah. and I still feel like an imposter. It's yeah. like I'm representing something that's not yeah. factual. Yeah, but I, I, I'm very careful about making sure that I don't put anything out there that is not factual. Right. That, so when I wrote the first book, I got a good piece of advice because I'm like, yeah, I, I think my fear was putting it out there. Yeah. Because once you release that book, like you open yourself up to criticism. Sure. And so I started to hate the book. Somebody said that's when the realization is that your book is actually ready to be released. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you, are you proud of your books now, or, or or what? It's almost like a process that you go through. Like, yeah. Do you go through a life cycle? Absolutely. With, Everything has a, a product cycle to every book. Where mm-hmm. you know, I hate it, and then at the end, it's like I like it, and then when it comes out, I'm proud of it because I've I've done all I can to it. Um, you know, as the writer, you know where the bodies are buried. You know the parts that are better and the parts that are weaker, and and. I just feel like, you know, everybody's like, oh, it must feel so great to finally send it off the publisher the last time. It's like, that's the scariest part at all because, you know, the book comes out and people are like, wait a second, you, the, that's not the capital of Botswana or, or whatever, you know, and you're going to hear that for the rest of your life. And, um, you know, there, there's always things like that. And, of course, your friends and family are like, what are you upset about? This is like, this yeah. book is good. And you're like, yeah, no, 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 you have to say that. I'm your, your husband yeah, or yeah, your, yeah. your son or yeah. your... Yeah, n- n- it's always so frustrating for me. No one, no one in my world will listen to me when I tell them impending doom is coming for the next book. You know, it's like I, I don't, ha- I haven't written enough words. It's not going to be done on time. I'm not going to be happy with it. I haven't been able to do the research. And I've, and this, there's a point every year where that's going on, and mm-hmm. everybody's like, "Oh, it'll be great. It's always great." And I'm, you know, you just want to grab people and shake them and go like, "You're not listening to me." And I, I don't know if you ever saw the um, the documentary about making Apocalypse Now. Yes, it's fantastic. Of yeah, okay, yes. it's fantastic. There's it's, this, it's very fucked up too. I mean, yeah, like, totally. Like, oh god, what a nightmare. Um, but they, uh, Coppola basically says something that I've been saying for years. He's like, no one will listen to me. <laughs> that it's all you know coming off the rails right now. Um, you know, I, I guess I trust a little bit that, like I say that every year, and it never, you know, totally falls apart. So, um, and, you know, and you just work harder at the end of it to make it, yeah, to make it as good as you can. You know, it's, I'll give you another one. It'll lead to it as a sort of an example, but there are these perceptions when you look at some company that it's just so well run or this organization mm-hmm. is so well run or, hey, this military organization is so so well run. You talk to the leaders and they're like, hey, listen, this place is held together yeah. by duct tape, bailing wire, yeah. and bubble gum. And I'm like, no way. Yeah. But it's, and you, you were younger, too, when the Chicago Bulls were crushing it in yeah. the 90s. And you, yeah. you assume, like, oh, my God, these guys all get along. Yeah. They're the best. They're, they, they, they embody what it means to be a team. And then yeah. you see the last dance yeah. Yeah. documentary, uh-huh. and you're uh-huh. like, oh, yeah. they, 
they they were aligned to what they wanted, which was yeah. the championships. Yeah. But there was no, there was very little likability right. amongst yeah. all of them. There was a lot of chaos. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that probably happens a lot, you know, and, and, and I've, even the, the character, the gray man, the, the idea is there's this legend where everybody's talking about him as the best assassin in the world. And he's more like John McClane and Die Hard, just barely making it through, you know, barefoot on broken glass. And he doesn't believe his own hype. You know, he, he's, he's going like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not the best anything in the world. I almost got killed four times a day or, yeah. or, or whatever. Um, you know, that's harder to keep doing <laughs> book after book, you know, to keep that. But, I mean, that's part of the, the conceit of the story. Let, let me ask you this, and if this is accurate. You know, he's part of teams that mostly are military, uh, former military mm-hmm. members in the, the Gray Man series. Yeah. Um, was it Sierra Six? Yeah. Especially? Yeah. Uh, but there seems to be a friction between him and the military guys. Was that, I mean, that had to be very intentional. Why, what, what was yeah. the rhyme? I thought that? it was fun. You know, it's yeah. like, I like light and dark in the story. And it seems like if you had this guy who's from the civilian side and he was in some agency program yeah. that nobody w- was even allowed to know what it was. Um, and suddenly he's folded into this team of guys that all speak the same language. Yes. And, and um, I just thought, you know, that would be like fascinating. And he's trying to figure the equipment out and they're, you know, asking him, you know, like, are you parachute qualified? And he's like, well, qualified. Yeah. You know, and they're <laughs> just like, Oh my God. And, um, but uh, he's, he's forced to join this team because yes. they feel like he's, yes. you know, or the people above the team feel like he's a value added, but the guys on the team don't see it. And, yeah. uh, and th- that went through the, that whole first book. And I just thought it would be possible. You know, if, if this really unlikely thing happened, that's probably my, how it might go down, but also thought it'd be kind of fun for the reader to see that. It, it, when, when, when I read that, it was almost though, like it's, his way of sort of poking the ribs of military yeah. guys, which is easy to do. Yeah, Cause yeah. one, he's off the charts intelligence, but people don't see that. Right. And two, it, it's almost, he, I took it as he, he sort of dislikes conformity yeah. in a sense. Yeah. Um, we, I just thought it was well done. Thank you. It was Thank well you. done. Man. Yeah. What's for you personally, do you, do you, I mean, your intent, and in, in, I'm not, this is not a podcast where we try to get the, like the, 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 uh, <laughs> Naval the <data>. juicy, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, dirt, but I mean, do you keep the gray man series going as long as possible? Or for you, is it like, Hey, I, at a point I need to, to end this chapter of my life. No pun on words there. Yeah. And then move on to, to, to something else. Or are you just still having so much fun with the gray man? It's just, I still like doing it. They get tougher and tougher to do because I, the, the weird thing about me is I have all these great macro ideas, mm-hmm. or I don't know if they're great, but I have all these macro ideas that the story could be about this, could be about this, could be about this. But I need a new way to have a guy chase another guy through a mall or for a you know this person to conduct some sort of counter surveillance where they find out the reason. You know, it's like I've done those things so many mm-hmm. times. And mm-hmm. so my like joke is if I think up something cool, I can't use it. I have to think up 24 things cool <laughs> and use the 24th thing because I've written 23 books. And um, every book is going to have somebody tailing someone else or somebody, you know, a gunfight. I mean, how many different ways can you do it? And it's like, well, I'll let you know. Um, I'm so far, I've, I've, made, I've come up with a bunch. And, um, you know, it's so it, it gets, they get tougher to do, not easier. Mm-hmm. I think my, I mean, I know my writing gets, is better than it was in the earlier books, um, just from having done it. So I have more confidence in my writing. Um, but, you know, I sit there and, and start coming up with something. I'm going like, ah, this is a little too much like that. And I can't use this and I can't use that. So I, I don't, I don't know how many gray man books there'll be. I really like doing them. Um, I've told my wife, I'm like, I'm never going to retire. I'm going to die with a half written book you know i don't if it's tomorrow or if i'm 93 it's but how really, powerful is that yeah I, I really like doing what i do yeah um for the for the next yeah mark rainey just as tom clancy sort of passed to you yeah for yeah, to come exactly. finish and yeah it, are there any characters that you've written about that may be a passion project in the future like hey i could actually build another series around this person with a gray man <laughs> yeah a lot of people want to do want me to spin off this character zach hightower um, and I would like to do that. Um, he, the book I'm writing now, Gray Man 13, he's a huge part of the book. Um, and so, and he's, uh, he's an ex-seal. He's basically, as a hunting guide, he's, he goes and 
finds his daughter who's been in witness protection for reasons that don't really make sense, but I wrote about it so long yeah, ago. Yeah. <laughs> but it's cool. You know, it's just like, it's like, just give me that, that she's in Wipro. Um, and, uh, and he finds her. And, uh, and so he's just kind of like aimless. And then he's, he's basically, there's an, kind of an Elon Musk type character. Mm-hmm. He's asked to do security for him. Yes. And then, of course, hell, it, hell it, ensues. Yeah. Um, so he's a huge part of the next Gray Man book. He could have his own series. Um, the character Zoya, who's a former Russian foreign intelligence officer, um, she could have her own series at some point. But these books take a while to write, mm-hmm. and I want to keep the quality up. And people all the time are like, write faster. I can't believe I have to wait another year. Do you and push back against publishers? Like, no, I won't. No, I won't no, these aren't my publishers. These are like fans. Okay. They're, they're going like, you need to, you know, I can't believe I have to wait this long. And I'm like, yeah, I'm i got to keep the quality high so you like these. <laughs> it's more important to me that you like them than you get two a year. You know how the and Avengers turn out a f- film and then you got to wait a year? Yeah. Like, same thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's like, it's like you, you have to start it over. And then I, I'll have people email me, and they're like, oh, your ebook costs $2 more than it should. And I'm like, you're coming to the guy that spent eight months of his life working on this. You should probably complain to somebody else because those $2 feel, it feels like worthwhile to me. And, and somebody asked me this before we, 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 we close it out. Um, they wanted to, uh, me to ask you, have, has there ever been a ha- aha moment where you wrote about something, let's say in 2015, that came true like years later or, or relatively close to what you wrote about? Yeah, I mean, th- th- things like that. Have, well, uh, Burner, the book that I, I, mm-hmm. I have now, it, I had, there's a Russian foreign intelligence um, it's infiltrated different Western uh agencies and governments to influence um, a peace treaty over Ukraine. And then the book came out in February. Well, I turned it in in September. And, you know, the head of counterintelligence in New York uh, FBI field office or former, you know, was, was caught taking money from Oleg Deripaski. Mm-hmm. And um, a, uh, a Russian GRU guy was getting into the International Criminal Court and, and got busted. And a lot of people are like, well, he was just going to be an intern. How, how much trouble could he be? Like, if he has a thumb drive, he could be a lot of trouble. Um, that's, how, that's how espionage is done these days. Yeah. And then, um, you know, a, a German BND guy, uh, their intelligence service was, was working for the Russians. So, so, you know, I knew those. That's all kind of in the book. And I knew that sort of stuff was happening. But, like, you see three things just back to back yeah. to back as the book came, came out. It's sort of, it's, it's vindicated. It's the moment that you're like, I called it. Yeah. I called it. <laughs> Good. Well, dude, Mark, this is, um, but also before we close out, uh, any, any future things coming that, that you want to let everyone know about yeah. to, to anticipate? Yeah. So, um, Gray Man 13 is called, um, the chaos agent and it'll come out next February. And I ha- I'm writing, a. Uh, Last year I had a book called Armored that came out, mm-hmm. and it was uh, about a civilian military contractor, and that's turned into a series. So I'm writing the second one in that series, and I said, I'll, I'll, I'll go to Africa for that, and I'm going to Cuba to do uh, research on Gray Man. And so next year I'll have to, I'll have those two books coming out. I have no idea when the next movie will come out, but they're, the last I heard they're working on the script. You, so. you can't control that process. I, I yeah. cannot control that process. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll find out when you do. <laughs> Hollywood's a monster that uh, I, I would – uh, I'm not surprised, uh, yeah. controls their own destiny. Yeah. Well, w- we close this out with, uh, really a few questions, uh, cause I'm just interested in success regardless of domain or industry as we call it. I mean, right. you're a warrior within your, your respective profession, um, and recognized accordingly. Um, what do you think have been the keys to your success? And I have a feeling you're going to give some unique ones, the things that you would pass to your stepchildren. If you do these three things, you're, you're most likely on the path to success in life. The, 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 the largest thing is loving what you do, and I won't go too long into it, but I, I was in my late 30s. I had no success in, in work uh, or in business or in life. Um, I wanted to be a writer, but I was piddling, and I rejected and rejected and rejected, and I had, I've, I've had almost no epif- epiphanies in my life. I almost don't believe in that stuff, but I had this epiphany one day. It's like, even if you don't get published, you love writing books, and you love th- – living in that space and thinking about that sort of stuff. That's the way your brain works. And if you could just enjoy it for what it is, because as a writer, you almost never have a good day writing. You know, it's like even if you write 3,000 words, it's like you still got another 112,000 to go, you know. So it's, it's just like there's, there's, there's not a lot of victories in there. It's just the final thing is, is your victory. And so I just told myself, it's like stop freaking out about being successful at this and just – 
do it because you like it. And immediately good things happened for me, you know, and, and it did take me like two more books, but I liked writing those books. And, um, and then once, like I, the other thing is like, once I, like I said, I got my fingernails on the, on the bottom rung of the publishing industry. I was like, I am not letting go. It's like, yeah. they're going to have to pry my hands off of this. And so, you know, when I was asked if I wanted to do ghostwriting, your name is not on the book. You write a whole book and your name's nowhere on it. Well, it's, it was working as a professional writer and talking to people, you know, in the, in the, you know, military community that I wouldn't get to talk to otherwise. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I'll do that. And, um, a lot of people, you know, turn their nose up at that, you know, they're waiting for their, you know, their big Harry Potter or whatever. And so they're, they're not going to, you know, take these smaller jobs. So it was just, you know, just working at it. But any, the, any the other thing is just, you only fail, you, you know, that's, you, you only fail if you quit. And every failure along the way was was falling forward. It's it's just like another step in the path, and it's not the step <laughs> you, that you want at the time. It doesn't look like success, but I can look back at the fact that I was rejected by this for this book, this book, and this book, and be so thankful that I was because the book that came out was the right one for me, and I've learned so much along the way. Oh, y- y- we call that failing forward. Failing and forward, yeah. Re- reframing how you, yeah. look, you you view failure. Yeah, um, I love the love what you do. Yeah. Um, especially in the face of rejection. Yeah. But you, you said something that is so powerful, and I know you, you probably have one more that you want to give. Um, is everyone hears or sees your story, and they're like, oh, well, he just he made it big. Yeah. They don't see the 15 years yeah. that you put in before. They just think it just happened yeah. instantaneously overnight. Right. And that, like, right. once you had momentum, you were you were good. Yeah. And the fact that even after you, you'd published books, you did the ghost writing. Yeah. And people, yeah. I mean, you were sharpening your blade the entire time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, it, it was working in the thing that you always wanted to do. And, um, you know, people would say, I, I used to say the job I had, I worked in a cubicle. It's like I could do this job in my sleep. The problem is I'm, I basically am doing it in my sleep because all I'm doing is thinking about books, you know. And, but once I started doing exactly what I should be doing, um, my energies and everything are just focused and there's so much – it's just – positive because that's that's the I am in line with the person you know I my job and my personality and everything are, are in line and if you can if you can find that I think you have to stick with it even if you don't like it and uh, you know I'm not one of those people who say never quit because honestly yeah. honestly you know I'd, I'd love to be an f1 driver I yes. would probably not be <laughs> I'd yeah. probably die really quick um so there are you know you have strengths and weaknesses but you can definitely if if you're doing something that you love then then you're halfway there yeah, it's so true. So true. In, in success and that your definition of success, you got to make sure that it's no one else's. Yeah. Uh, most strong Th- that's a good that. way of putting it. Yeah. Uh, the, the last question we ask in, in it's fair. Some people are not concerned about a legacy. I'm terrified about mine. Mm. Um, mainly if, if I impacted people, but if legacy matters to you and, and what you're remembered for, what would you want to be remembered for when all is said and done? I mean, no one's ever asked me that. That's a tough one. Um, honestly, just a good person in, in general, you know, and, 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 and in the books, I want people to see that, you know, I'm passionate about things, but, you know, the, the, the character is a positive thing. And in my personal life, you know, I want my kids to, you know, respect me after yeah. I'm gone and, yeah. and, you know, friends and family to, to like me and I like them back. And so I, I think, you know, I, I just kind of want to be a positive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does it, let me ask you this. Uh, does it provide you any joy knowing that you give people, uh, I, I'm trying to find the word, an escape sometimes, yeah. a reprieve? Like, Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. I have this real blue collar mentality to writing. It's like people will email me and say, oh, you know, I had a 12 hour flight and I read your book the whole way and time went by. And yeah. it's like, I love, a, that is a product, you know, it's like, that is cool. Or we had a snowstorm and the power was out and all I did was read your books and it was so amazing. And I'm like, there for you, man. And, and, and uh, you know, like my guy recently, his, his mom was dying in the hospital and he was there every day and he's reading gray man books. And, you know, he's like, it helped the time pass. And I'm like, that is, that's really impactful because I know what books have done for me yes. in my life. They've got me through some tough times with escapism. So it's, it's hard for me to see myself as these writers that I used to love, you know, like, I'm Mm -hmm. like, you compare me to Frederick Forsyth, I think you're an idiot, (laughs) because Frederick Forsyth is so good. Um, But, 
but you're now in that level, dude. <sighs> I don't know, but 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 it, it's it's amazing to me that you know like people get something out of my books just like I got out of all yeah. these great people's books. I know you don't want to say it, but when you have 15 New York Times bestsellers <laughs> that have rotated between number one to to, to the top 10, yeah, you, you're at that level. Thank you very much. You know, it's funny, you know, people think, well, you know, I only learn from nonfiction books. One of the greatest one leaders are readers. Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer in that. Yeah. But one of the the most pivotal books, funny enough, this book was passed from General McChrystal to a guy named Chris Fussell, who's the president of McChrystal Group. Okay. Uh, and then Chris Fussell was basically my commanding officer okay. and passed me the book. It's called Once an Eagle, and it is fictional history. Oh. Um, Sam Damon uh, and uh, Corey Massengale are, you know, Sam Damon is the, the protagonist. Uh, Corey Massengale is the antagonist. Uh -huh. Two officers that fight in World War One, World War Two, Korea. Vietnam, they both become oh, generals wow. on very different paths wow. and very different methods. And everyone wants to be Sam Damon. Yeah. But they're fake characters. But it's actually mandatory reading for the service academies. Yeah. Um, fiction. Yeah, I, I'm sure it's fiction that's like researched incredibly well oh, yeah. by I'm people sure. that, yeah. that that knew the stuff. And so, yeah, I, I think that, I think that's a, you know, I, I picked up Clancy because I was studying the Irish Republican Army in, in college and I saw a Patriot Games about IRA, and I was like, oh, everybody's been talking about this Clancy dude. I'll, I'll see what the, this fun little book is about. And I learned so much from that. And then it's when I learned. You can actually learn from these things, and you can actually, you know, kind of inform people a little bit. It, it is interesting when you say that. Like, he was, he was very much shaped by what was going on in his times. Yeah. And you, you were shaped by what was yeah. going on in your uh, times. Yeah. 100%. Uh, I, have the, I have the benefit of the internet, which he didn't have. Yeah, that's you know, true. The research that he did. That's true. Jane's Intelligence Weekly and... But he wasn't turning out books every year. No. Is no. He, what was his timeline? Two, uh, three? two to three. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's how the speed of business is yes. accelerated. It, yeah, exactly. They need that out of you every year. You just you just have to produce. We will drop it in socials, but the best way for people to follow you, uh, markgraney.com. Yeah, markgrannybooks.com. Right? Markgrannybooks.com. Yeah. Mm -hmm. are, are you on Instagram? Yeah, I'm on all the social medias. Yeah. Markgrannybooks, yeah. And I'm sure... Given your age like me, you don't really post personal stuff. It's all business. You know, I post pictures of my dogs, <laughs> yeah. and and you know, if something funny happens, I'll I'll post pictures. So I'm I'm it's it's less business than some people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I post a picture of uh, Bane as a Dutch Shepherd. Uh -huh. You know, we used Belgian Malinois yeah, as a yeah. Dutch Shepherd. Did you see that picture last night where he's biting the the chicken foot? It's full of teeth. Somebody commented, they're like, hey, that dog's a liability. I'm like, thank you for your input. Uh, <laughs> there is just keyboard uh, yeah. cowards oh, everywhere, yeah. man. <laughs> well, Mark, I can't thank you enough for joining us. Uh, we'll drop all the uh, the handles where people can follow you. And for everyone, uh, probably one of my most interesting uh, podcasts, Into the Mind of <laughs> Somebody Who's Very Unique. So, uh, again, thanks for joining us on the Men's Journal Everyday Warrior Podcast. We'll see you again uh, next time. And also, go leave a damn review on, on Apple uh, if you got time. Uh, that's how we improve. You leave feedback on there. It helps us improve. Uh, the art of the debrief, as we call it in the military, uh, really helps us out. So that would be much appreciated. All right, guys. Thanks. Thank you.